and welcome to the GSB. We are so excited to have you here for View from the Top. So excited. Great. <laughs> well, before we start, I want to do a quick poll. So please raise your hand if you have done a 23andMe test before. Wow. OK, you have a strong market base here at the GSB. But there's a lot more that could be. <laughs> I, like, I, I see no. I see opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to survey at the end to see how many people are going to get it now. <laughs> so I have done 23andMe mm -hmm. as well. And I just wanted to ask you one question about my test results. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> I do a lot of customer care support. <laughs> So should I be concerned that my results said that I have more than 92% or I have 92% more Neanderthal DNA mm. than the average customer? What is that about? That is a fun fact that you should share at all parties. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's actually, the Neanderthal report is, um, is kind of an example of some of the things that we've done where... Um, we try to make genetics and frankly like try to make all of science relatable, make it something that's fun for people. Um, so honestly, one of the first things, I was at a, um, a TED dinner once and we were talking about, there was Craig Vent, like all these famous genetics people and they were talking to a bunch of tech leaders and um, they were talking about like the latest results in one area or another and then um, I brought up something about asparagus and how you can smell it in your pee. And 45 minutes later, people were still talking about the asparagus and the pee question. And I realized like people want scientific information that's like kind of fun, kind of the cocktail party conversation and something that's interesting. So Neanderthals was absolutely like one of the interesting parts. Like it teaches people about science and then it does become one of those things like people are always comparing. Like I have so much Neanderthal, like what does that mean? And what should I do about it? So it's definitely, it's interesting. But no, it's a, it's a proud fact that you should post okay. widely on everything. Thank you, thank you. I hope you can all find your I think that's facts. why you got in. Yeah, yeah. actually, I think so, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, since we're already talking about 23andMe, I'd mm -hmm. love to dig in a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So I'm amongst, and many of us here, are amongst the 12 million users. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to take us back to day one, actually. How did you convince that initial set of customers to buy a DNA Ancestry kit? Well, we didn't convince very many people. <laughs> um, we had, I'd say, like, one of the things that's great about 23andMe, and that was also a shortcoming in those early days, like, we're incredibly strong on the science. And I had two scientific co-founders from Stanford who had just finished their PhDs, and they had joined, and we created essentially like the product we dreamed of. Like, how can I peruse my chromosomes and look at all the different reports and see what they mean and like explore? It was like kind of the like academic fantasies. And we had like we have a product now called Ancestry Composition. In the early days, we had these PCA plots, and it was like it was relatively technical and hard to see. Um, and we thought it was all great. And so we did no marketing research at all. So like from a business school perspective, like we did not assess market demand. We just kind of made the hypothesis like of course everyone wants their genome. Like of course everyone's going to want to get it. So um, it was academically like very interesting and it was controversial. So we were the front cover of, um, we were above the fold front page of the New York Times when we launched. Um, Amy Harmon wrote the article. It was the only time New York Times has ever written sort of a per first person account of like them doing a product. Um, we were the cover of Wired. Thomas Getz wrote that piece. Um, so we got tons of coverage and the first day we sold a thousand kits. And um, after that, we sold like, it trickled down to like 10 to 15 kits a day. And, um, and we didn't have any marketing team. Um, we just kind of assumed it would be word of mouth. It was $1,000 and the value proposition was not clearly there. It was like really sort of an academic product. So that was kind of the first moment in the company where we were like, huh, um, we might have to do a little bit more product market research here um, to figure out what's gonna drive sales. But I think the first customers that we got were really people who um, are sort of the quantified self world, like the people who just want to test themselves on everything. And I would say, you know, there's like a, a market of 50 to 100,000 people who are just like, I want to try it all. Um, and those were the people who were coming our way, who happened to also have the spare $1,000. Um, but it was, it was pretty brutal um, the, the first few years. 
Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. And so now you found product market fit, you found all these amazing customers. Well, I would say we're still finding product market fit. Okay. I mean, I think what's interesting for me with genetics, and I don't know, you know, healthcare, I mean, it's, such, it's so interesting because GSB, like you guys have founded so many amazing companies and the tech world has really come from here. And there's all kinds of areas that have been really revolutionized. But healthcare is this last frontier that has not really been evolved. And, um, and the reality is like, it's not just like it's this frontier, it's like kind of like a different solar system. Um, healthcare doesn't operate in the same way. Like it's not, you know, we all use healthcare, but none of us are the customers. Like you're just the means for generating revenue, but like somebody else is paying the bill. So it's really challenging to change and it's also incredibly fragmented. So in the tech world, when there's a new technology that comes out, it's rapidly, it's usually rapidly adopted. Like you look at like the, you know, what's happened with machine learning and, and TensorFlow and all these things that Google puts out, like it gets adopted relatively fast. And the human genome was sequenced, you know, 20 years ago. And I would say, Nick, how many people have had their doctor recommend that they get their, their, their genome and use it outside of pregnancy or outside of cancer? Like it's almost none. And so part of the issue we have right now is like genetics has still not been adopted by the existing system. And there's all kinds of laws for that reason. So for instance, doctors, you know, there's no profit motive for people to get this information. So a doctor does not make money if they give a diagnostic. And so there's good things about that, like you don't want them excessively recommending, but for that reason as well, like no one is really motivated to create extra work for themselves. So when I think about product market fit, um, there's still this huge chasm between, I have lots of consumers who are frankly like really eager to do more and take more ownership of their health, but the healthcare world's really not set up in any capacity to help them execute on that. And so, you know, doctors are not trained on genetics, doctors are not used to, you know, people coming in with more information, and frankly, prevention is not a reimbursed, you know, part of medicine. It's like not, like if you, like figuring out how you can exercise or how you should eat better is not something that you get from your doctor. You get that on your own. But frankly, like that has, that's a huge component of all kinds of prevention. So we're still working on product market fit and how you actually create a new industry that frankly is direct to consumer and how you're inspiring people to take more ownership of their own health, but it's also an out-of-pocket expense. Mm. Yes, I think that's a very humble answer. You have 12 million <laughs> customers, which is amazing. <laughs> we, and I'd like to talk yeah. about those, yeah. those 12 million because obviously selling kits is one part of the business, but then when you have these 12 million plus customers, there's a swath of data, of course, that, that right. comes along with that and massive opportunity in the therapeutic space. Uh, so I'm curious, as you're moving to focusing really on that data, what gets you excited about all that data? Well, I mean, this, that, that is like, for me, when I think about like starting the company, like that was a huge part of my incentive and my dreams. Um, I find it fascinating that we all have, like all of life comes from a really simple code. So for those of you who are engineers or you know, coders, like it's just, it's like mind blowing to me how remarkably simple. You have an A, C, G, and T, and that accounts for all of life on this planet. And um, it's like small variations, like you and all of us are 99.5% the same. And I always tell my kids, like you're 50% banana, and you're like 90% mouse. So like you're very similar to everything. Like it's remarkable to me that we don't understand this code. So I think about like every night you go to bed and like your body just, everything works. It's like you live in this incredibly complex system and we have no idea how it works. Like I just, to me, this is the ultimate puzzle. It's like really, like, and as a kid, it used to just keep me up at night. Like, how does it all happen? And, and even things like how all of your cells can differentiate and like how they turn out, like, I just, I, it's mind blowing to me. Um, so by understand, by having a large amount of data, we're starting to understand what does the human genome mean? And you have some really 
like simple example. So for instance, like one mutation causes whether or not you have dry earwax or wet earwax. Like another really fun medical example. Um, but the, the reason why we put out the dry earwax and the wet earwax kind of report is because it teaches people that you can have like one simple genetic variation and that can cause a different phenotype, like a different trait. And so what's really interesting for me is by having 13 million people, almost 13 million people and billions of data points is that we're starting to make sense of the human genome. And frankly, like this should translate one day, like when you have billions and billions, it should translate one day is like, how do you actually really understand the code of life? And that's really for me, like the ultimate goal here is like you wanna understand it. And when I think about drug discovery, my background when I was investing on Wall Street was in biotech. And biotech's a really, like it's, it's amazing because the science is so interesting. But from an investing perspective, um, like there was one well-known investor, he was like, Ann, I love biotech. He's like, 90% of everything fails. I just short it all. And, <laughs> and, and like, that's true from an investor perspective. There's some reality to that. Like statistically, most of it's going to fail. But for me, it's like, I want to create things that are going to work. I want to create things that are actually going to have an impact on people. So if you start with human genetics, you are more than twice as likely to be successful. So one of my hopes here was like to bring structure and you know a new kind of approach to drug discovery so more of those drugs would actually succeed and i again i think about my dad's a physicist we mentioned my dad's particle physics like my dad used to always complain he's like oh you biologists like it's so confusing you're such a disaster it's like so it's like all over the place there's no structure and you know, there's some truth to it. Like, it's really complicated. Um, and physics has its laws and its principles. So for me, that's like part of the goal. It's like in some ways, once we have enough data, how do you bring enough structure so that then you could really have very rational drug design and actually be able to have a much higher success rate? Mm -hmm. One unique aspect of the data that you have is there is a self-selecting aspect to it. Mm -hmm. A lot of, most of the data that you have is people who have signed up for the kits. So how do you think about that when you're making pretty large generalizations potentially about the data that you have? Well, we get this a lot about like, what's our bias? And again, coming from Wall Street and looking at all clinical trials, I was gonna say, I've never seen a data set that doesn't have a bias. So it's not bad that we have a bias. The important thing is to know what it is and to be able to identify it and then you account for it. So I would also say now that we are you know, so large, we have pretty amazing representation and diversity of all site, of all types within the data set. So we now, and that was part of the push we had for 10 million is like at 10 million you get you know, a lot of statistical power to do analysis on, on most disease areas. Um, so there's absolutely always a, a, a bias because we are self-selecting, it's people who are paying, um, you know, lowest entry point is $100, um, but we do attract people for very different reasons, and I would say the ancestry customers, which also do consent for research, you know, are coming in at a lower price point and are also interested in a different type of um, product than my health customers. So I would say again, like my main thing is with data is it's important in some ways just to go for size. Like size really is the number one thing that matters. And secondly, is like really understanding your limitations, but not like there's no such thing as the perfect data set. Right. Well, your intention around women and other disadvantaged groups and getting data around them is so important because there are not enough medical studies uh, done on women and, and people and other uh, groups and so is that something that you think about as well as, as we do benefit? we think a lot about I mean most genetic studies have been done in European populations right. so that's one of the other things like we are still majority European um, within 23andMe but the fact that we are um, you know 20 30 percent of 23andMe is non-European um, that makes us the largest in the world of non-European genetic studies so there's things that we can do um, that absolutely will attract and encourage more, you know, certain populations to come in. And I think that's something that's more and more of a priority for 23andMe is to make sure that we're, you know, attracting not just a European population, but a very broad population. And just to emphasize, I think people don't realize, um, in some ways, like, studying Africa is, um, 
is one of the most important and exciting opportunities in genetics because there's more diversity in Africa than there is in the rest of the world. And so there's gonna be a tremendous number of really interesting genetic insights that come from there. So we're reaching a point, um, there's been all kinds of you know, challenges before with the complexity of studying um, different populations, but we're getting to a point where we actually really have that opportunity uh, to do a lot more in every population. And we think about ourselves even as we put out a report, how do we hold ourselves to a bar that we're not just putting out content for a European population, but putting out content for all different communities. Mm. I'd like to go back to what you were saying about marketing and how mm -hmm. it wasn't initially a huge focus. Mm. Um, and in 2013, you unexpectedly got a note from the FDA to discontinue marketing of the tests. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of crisis management case studies here at the GSB, and I'm curious if you did, who was your first call and what advice did they have for you? Oh, good question. I, um, I love, so it's like, it's definitely one of the parts when I speak at Rob Siegel's class, it's like one of the key things. I love him asking the students like, oh, was it Silicon Valley arrogance or ineptitude? And <laughs> I love always hearing people talk about us. And I just did another talk, the um, innovator's dilemma where like also like there was really this sense is like, oh, you were so inept. Um, and, <laughs> um, and so what people don't realize on 23, we did get a warning letter. Um, I'm almost proud is that like it was one of the most well-read warning letters ever. Um, it was it was definitely um, it w and partly it was it was um, an unusual warning letter because it was so angry. Um, what's interesting is um, when 23andMe was started, like I said, we were very academic, um, and one of like we were also very like because we were academic, like we actually had we hired Joanna Mountain who came from Stanford. She was an assistant professor here. We had an IRB. Like we thought through. We thought through a lot, like we engaged with ethics, like Hank Greeley, who still doesn't really love us, but we engaged with him. Um, like we were, like I've been, like I come from an academic background, like I love debate. Like tell me more, what can I do? What's like where am I wrong? So we totally engaged. And one of the first people we had called was um, David Kessler, who was the former commissioner of the FDA. So he's like clearly very experienced. Um, he was a professor at UCSF, and he pulled together his whole team, like his senior advisors from when he was in the administration. And we sat down, and we're like, are we a medical device? And we really debated this. Like, it was a whole debate with his team, like, what, like, what are we? And um, concluded, we're not a medical device. And, you know, in those early days, it was kind of a question. Like, you have the right to own your genome. Like, it's your data, like the same way you have a right to look in a mirror, like that's your image, like you have the right to have it. So you have the right to have your genome, and in my mind, all I was doing was like connecting you to publicly available literature. Like, that seemed totally reasonable. Um, so in those early days, we concluded we're not a medical device, and, um, and then we even met with people like Von Eschenbach, who was also at the, F who was actually the FDA commissioner at the time, and he was super clear, you are not a medical device, and we will not be touching you and regulating you. And one thing that was like a kind of a political wake-up call and like a, just a company wake-up call is that when um, Obama was, came into office, like that changes everything, and the leadership of the FDA changed, and they said, like, no, you are not, like, you know, outside of our reign of regulation. Like, we are going to regulate you. And so it was an overnight kind of shift. Like, we had just been told for years that we were not going to be regulated. And then it became very clear, like, you, you're not just going to be regulated. But, like, we're coming, we're coming now. So um, the first... The, so I got the letter on a Friday, and then I had the weekend to sort of think about it and my typical stance. I was like, oh, it's not such a big deal. Um, <laughs> and then they made the letter public, and Kessler called me. And he called me and he said, Anne, I know you, and I know you're not paying attention. <laughs> and, um, and I'm telling you now that it's a big deal. Mm. And, um, and it, was, it was, you know, we had, the company really had to pivot. And I had no shortage of people. Um, like there was an article Fortune wrote called 23 and Stupid. Um, I had no shortage of people, you know, like well-known geneticists who were like, you know, you, it's time for you to step back and let us clean up your mess. Um, like no shortage of people who love to come and be like, the woman with no degree, like I was really screwing up the industry. And, um, 
I had one really great mentor, and it was a regulator, um, also a woman, who said, Anne, you have two choices. Like, do you want to sell the company? I was like, no. She's like, well, then you put your head down and you just do the work. Like, get the work done. She's like, but I'm telling you now, it's going to take you five to ten years. And, um, and we were lucky because we had cash. We had that ability. I found an amazing leader to do it. And frankly, it was the best thing for the company because I think one of the most important things 20 to me has proven out is that consumers actually can get genetic information. And most healthcare providers, I would say, tend to assume that you're not capable of changing your behavior or understanding complicated information. And we have now successfully really proven out that like, you can understand really complex concepts. And we had to prove to the FDA that, you know, over, you know, like a at a certain grade level, you know, over 90% could pass actually like tests. And we had to prove that with our reports, they can do that. And we did. And, um, you know, we now have, you know, six, seven FDA authorizations. Um, we're the only ones who have gone down this whole path. And I feel like we, like when I think about us as advocates, like one of like 23 Me as an activist brand, like we are advocates for consumers and proving out that you are far more capable of taking care of yourself than the healthcare system today believes. Hmm. And as you've just described, healthcare is obviously a heavily regulated industry. Mm -hmm. And many of us will be going into other heavily regulated industries, whether it's healthcare or FinTech or what have you. I'm curious, obviously you had some great conversations and some great points of contact, but what was the best and maybe worst advice that you got around regulation? Well, it's interesting. The night before, I mean, like the night before I got my FDA warning letter, I was actually at a healthcare political dinner. I won't say which group, but it was like a group and they were like, oh, Anne, you're getting so stale. Like you should do something more crazy. And <laughs> Um, I just want to say that was like a group of like healthcare regulators, et cetera, who were like, you got to keep pushing boundaries. And then the next day I got my warning letter. So clearly that team was pushing in the wrong direction. Um, I mean, look, I think, I think the number one thing that, um, you know, the best advice we got when we ha had our letter was, um, you know, you're on the right side of history. And so it's just a matter of time. So one thing I remind people in the company is that when we started 23andMe, gay marriage was illegal. So the world does change. So, and it changes because of advocacy, because of like people rising up, and also because of data. So when people ask, like, how did 23andMe convince the, the, the FDA, we convinced them with data. Like, we, we went head to head with like their arguments, and we we're like, we're going to prove out that we are accurate, that people can get it. Um, so I think the most important advice for people is knowing that um, whatever the laws are now or whatever the regulations are, like things can change and society is constantly changing, but you have to put together the right kind of package and the right data and the right support to drive that change. But it's totally mutable. Mm. One obvious big societal Mm -hmm. change in the past three years has been the pandemic. And I'm curious mm -hmm. how COVID-19 has informed your strategy for how 23andMe can engage in potentially future health crises. Well, I think what was interesting during the pandemic is we had, um, because we have millions of people who are consented for research, who are part of it, um, very rapidly we were able to put out a questionnaire to uh, customers and, um, and you know, collect you know, hundreds of thousands. And now I think we have like one and a half million people who've taken our COVID survey. So very quickly, we were able to actually do research on you know, why are some people getting so sick? Why are some people not getting sick? Like even now, I'm kind of fascinated. Like there must be genetics about why some people, some people must be genetically resistant. And you see that with things like HIV. HIV, there's actually a mutation where people are resistant to getting it. Um, so we have the ability to very quickly survey millions of people and get information about them. So in this day and age, like it's kind of remarkable that there's no nationwide surveillance system for public health, and we have that ability now to really do that. Hmm. Another aspect of COVID that changed 
uh, how leaders interact was I heard a, a lot of CEOs having text chats or mm -hmm email exchanges with other business leaders, and I'm curious how you potentially leaned on other business leaders and what kind of maybe business community that you formed. Uh, it's actually, in, it's been, um, I mean, in some ways it's been kind of nice. Like I never had really the CEO business community before, but I feel like there's now where I, I do see more CEOs and we all have kind of like that same pain point of like, oh, it's really hard. Um, and like specifically, like right now it's really hard. Like. It's a really tight job market, um, so people all want a lot more money, and they, you know, return to office is super complicated. Like, is it hybrid? Is it in person? Everyone wants something different, um, and then the stock market has really collapsed, um, and so there's just a tremendous amount of uncertainty. And also, like, how do you develop culture in like a Zoom environment? Like you can't, like you all saw what it was like going to school in a Zoom environment, like it's not fun. And so like being in an, like having your office be a Zoom environment is also not fun. Um, so I think it's it's super complicated. So like right now it's actually really, it, it is fun. It's kind of relieving with other CEOs to be like, oh, like none of us really know what to do. Um, and so <laughs> there's comfort when you know, like we all have that pain of like, it's, it's really, it's hard. And like all the market dynamic, like, Everything is about being redefined. Like the whole, like work environments are never going to be the same. And so, how do you really have a hybrid environment? Mm -hmm. So that's been like the name, number one thing I think for me. And even at different policies, you know, talking to companies about like what are you doing for return to office, or are you like are people coming in? Like how do you manage vaccinations? Like everything has been sort of nonstop of you know, helping manage. And then also we've had all kinds of social unrest. So like also then how do you manage um, you know, George Floyd and you know, now you have Roe versus Wade. Like all of like political issues are also now really rising up to you know, really occupy people's minds. So how do you actually you know, also have a company and you know, in, in the background have such political issues? So I do think that as the world's gotten more complicated, there's been more, more bonding over complicated. Yeah. So much of what we learn at the GSB is around collaboration and doing mm -hmm. projects together and everything. So I think it's really nice to hear that that continues even when you're at the top. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think it's important to always reach out. I mean, I think that's one thing I just always like, I, and I, I have to say LinkedIn is amazing in this capacity. Like it's so easy to connect with people now and it's so it's, it's so lovely to go across industries. So I do think that people are particularly interested. Like, it's so dynamic right now. People are particularly interested in hearing different viewpoints. So I do think there's, it's like a particularly receptive time. Mm -hmm. You mentioned company culture briefly, mm -hmm. and every single guest that we've had on stage has talked about company culture. It's yeah. obviously very important. And how were you intentional about setting the culture at 23andMe? Well, I had, um, I had coming from Wall Street, and again, I, like, I lived in Wall Street during like kind of the craziest era, like 99, 2000, like most of you probably don't remember this, but it was really- Wolf of Wall Street. Oh yeah, for sure. Like I have, um, I mean, there's like some of my, there's like experiences when I see that, or even when I watch Billions, I was like, so parts of Billions are based on real experiences. Like there was one episode I was watching, I was like, I remember when that happened. Like there's just like, and they got down to the specifics of specific trades, like trades and information. Like it was, um, it was a totally crazy time. So in some ways, um, having that experience, like I learned a lot of things of what not to do. And I have one boss um, who was in jail. Um, and, you know, That's like a good I, start. Okay. I, so I, I always say, I was like, well, you know, like you, there's no better way to experience what not to do than, you know, living that. And, you know, I had another boss who would get so angry and would slam phones into the wall. And so it was also an interesting time, like watching Google start and Google being um, like really fun, like it was super supportive, it was really quirky, they like hired my sister when she was pregnant, um, people wore whatever they wanted, um, you know, like they were always rollerblading, Sergey and Larry were always <laughs> rollerblading into meetings. Um, 
So it kind of opened up the door. Like I do credit them. Like they opened up the door for having different types of cultures. And I've never been a person who likes veneers. Like I really, I have this like issue. Like I really hate things that are fake. Um, and so I don't like, and I don't like commercials for that reason. And I don't like, um, you know, like a, like a plastic office place where everyone's like dressed up nicely. Like I feel like it's just, it's a veneer. So, um, so having a culture that was authentic was really important to me. And having a culture where people felt really comfortable and you had diversity, like we're a genetics company, like we support diversity, like the, like the world is amazing because of diversity. So like we wanna support diversity. Um, I have always said, and I realize this with myself, is like you hire extraordinary people, but extraordinary people are not extraordinary every day. And so we're a team. And so for that reason, like if you get sick, someone can cover for you. Or if you're just like having a bad month, like you know, the team, like it doesn't sink everything and people don't get mad at you. Like we are a true team. And so I've always wanted to have a culture where we have extraordinary people, but like it's truly supportive and we have this diversity and kind of like an academic environment, like you're always learning. Like you have this humility of like, I know nothing. Like I still to say, like feel like I know nothing. Like I'm always just trying to learn. Um, and I look at my scientists and others, like there's always really, that humility is just so important. Um, so I think that's like, when I think about culture, it was really about authenticity and, um, you know, like truly supportive and supportive really, if I want to hire people and have them with me for 10 or 15 years, you have to be flexible with like work-life balance. You have to be flexible as people have other issues. So like a real balanced environment and one that was like really um, like hire humble people who like are super eager to learn from each other. And for that reason, I have like really great marketing people who know nothing about therapeutics and like therapeutics people who know nothing about, you know, CAC to LTV, like that, like it's just, it's so interesting to learn. And so I always tell people like join 23andMe and you should take advantage of the fact that you're like constantly learning really interesting different things. So culture for me, um, I think has to be really intentional. Um, and I think it's really important for me to have a positive culture where it's like supportive. And I'm really proud of like the number of people who have left 23andMe and gone off to start companies. Um, and like, and especially a, a huge number of women who've done it. And, um, and they, again, also are really focused on creating a positive culture. Hmm. So it spreads. Is there maybe a little specific norm or practice that you think represents the culture well? Something you guys do? Um, we're very focused on exercise. Like, so I <laughs> never dress like this. I only wear, it was like a big debate for me. Like, do I wear my shorts? Um, so I wear shorts, <laughs> t-shirts, and my running shoes every day. And I totally terrorize people who take the elevator. And <laughs> I, I wanted to put up the signs. There was a study that came out about like, hey, like you're sitting in the elevator, but like if you had just walked up those stairs, like it would have added like 30 seconds to your life. Um, so I just think like for me, exercise and health, like for me, it's like walk the walk. Like we have good food. It's healthy. Like we don't have soda. We... Um, encourage like we have lots of fitness classes um i have a huge number of people like we have a very intense workout culture like people love so like we have like intro to working out and then like more of the advanced like we have <laughs> lots of yoga um i do lots of yoga meetings like we just oh. like kq would be like, we'll put the notes on the floor and then you'd like downward dog and you read your notes you make <laughs> Hold one hand, you're in plank. Um, I Good mean, balancing. I think you can, yeah, you can be super creative with that. But I would say like that's, like I think a hallmark of our culture is the authenticity. Like you can be you and you don't have to, like there's no veneer that you're trying to put on. And um, you know, the best thing about being authentic too is like you make mistakes all the time. Mm. And then people, frankly, I think trust you more when you make mistakes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so many of us here are in healthcare, but many of us are not. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious from your perspective, what is a trend in healthcare today that we should all be aware of? Well, I think the trend that's hard to ignore is the rise of virtual. Um, so when I first went to Health 2.0, um, it was like a scary set of companies. It was just, um, 
I mean, this is probably 12, 13 years ago. It was like the bar, like it just was not starting yet. Um, and there was, it was just not starting yet. So now, you know, and even pre-pandemic, we used to meet with all kinds of companies that were, you know, virtual pharmacy or virtual telemedicine. And it was like such a niche. And 23andMe had talked about like, should we get involved in these areas? And I was like, ugh, like the last thing we need to do is like pioneer another whole path. Um, but the reality is like pandemic made virtual a requirement. Like it totally, like it's um, overnight, you had to start using virtual care. And you know, pharmacies and laws changed. So I mean, there was an incredible opportunity. Like this is an example where regulation really changed and it opened up a whole, a huge sector. So virtual is really interesting. The thing I'd point on is like almost all of these virtual companies are focused on employer and um, you know, health plan based care. Um, and that to me always feels odd. Like if you go and you join Amazon for two years and you're you know, pre-diabetic and you have a program, like why do you lose access to that program if you change jobs? Like why your healthcare is with your employer like really doesn't make sense to me. So part of what we've always tried to do is like create a world that's outside, like that you control that's outside of the system. And I would say that another trend is that more and more is truly going towards your own empowerment, meaning um, there's an act called 21st Century Cures that empowers you to be able to get access to all of your health records and move them around. And they're not making it fully easy yet, but it's like it's coming where you should be able to own all of your records. Um, but there's also now tr price transparency. Like there's really interesting companies now surfacing that you can actually like know if you need to go and get a mammogram, like what does it cost? So in the past, I would call around and try to get direct to consumer pricing for something and it was impossible. And now it's actually like these laws are in place to actually like force it. So I do, I'm a huge proponent. I think there's like really exciting direct to consumer worlds and most companies are still focused on employer. Um, and I would say, or like the Medicare populations, but I would say that there's a huge opportunity on direct to consumer and people, it's just harder um, because I think there is like a real shift um, that people have to get educated on. And I think one thing, again, just to emphasize on healthcare, and again, privacy is top of mind for lots of people. People don't realize that if your insurance company pays for you to do a procedure or something, they, they then know that and they own that information. So if you don't want your physician or your insurance company to know something, then you should self-pay. And so part of, again, like 23andMe, I always say is like proudly not HIPAA compliant because it actually forces us to get your real consent versus like HIPAA now. Like frankly, even like I'm always criticizing Stanford for this, like you don't have a way of opting out of their HIPAA form. So that means they can take, like I just went to a doctor the other day and they mandate taking your picture and you have to sign a consent form that they can do anything they want with it. Like really? Like can you imagine that if Facebook's like I'm gonna take your picture and then I have the ability to do anything I want with it and you have to consent for that? Like that's outrage. So um, I do think like people, like privacy and healthcare, people don't fully understand it. And you have GDPR and the California Privacy Act, like that's happened for the tech companies. But I think there's gonna be a change at some point in healthcare. People just haven't woken up to it yet. But there's like a really terrifying world of like how everything, all your health information is shared that you just don't know about. Mm. That's very helpful advice. And speaking of advice, mm -hmm. Half of us in this auditorium are actually graduating in three weeks, including myself. Wow. Uh, and many of us have been considering or are going to be pivoting their mm -hmm. careers. You've pivoted a few times, mm -hmm. and I'm curious what lessons you have to share with us. I think pivoting is the best thing ever. I think it's so, <laughs> it's, it's so, I mean, it's so interesting to, to learn different areas. Like, I don't know if you knew Larry Lessig, who was, used to be at Stanford, who ran like internet law, and then he was just like one day like, I wanna learn about corruption, and he moved to Harvard, and he's like, I'm gonna become an expert in corruption. And I just, it's so great, like to do the same thing all the time is just boring. So to do totally different things, like the world is so interesting, you should absolutely keep pushing yourself to just keep 
like pivot and do interesting things. I always encourage, I mean, I, I, I try to keep most people at 23 Me, but when someone's actually been there for a while and they want to try something else, I'm like, yeah, you should quit and like do something new. Like the world is so interesting. Like never shortchange yourself on like going and exploring. You guys are all like super, I mean, it's an amazing talent pool. Like everyone can go and get interesting job. Like it's, you owe it to yourself to go and have that exploration of totally different types of careers. And frankly, I think I'm, I feel grateful to my parents who, when we graduated college, there was no push to go and get a single job. So like I worked as a nanny, I worked in, um, like I tempt, I worked in all kinds of different random areas. And like all of those experiences were super helpful of knowing what you really want. And even obviously Wall Street was just a short term for me. And I think I'll be at, you know, I'll be at 23andMe for a while, but like I have this luxury of like, I'm always doing different things with 23andMe. I'm now in drug discovery more. And then personally, I have, you know, I do all these like real estate projects at home um, in Los Altos. Like that's super interesting. So I totally encourage, like keep pivoting and every experience adds up. And, um, you know, you never know when an experience is going to be valuable. And if it's not interesting, then quit. Great. Well, that was definitely an answer I needed to hear. So yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you, Anne. I yeah. deeply admire the conviction that you've had throughout your entire career, and I know all of us here are excited to see how you and 23andMe will continue to change the world. And I have more questions, but uh, I know we have some questions in the audience, so okay. I'd like to turn it over to them. Great. Hi, my name's Hi. Neil Renz. I'm a medical student and a business student here. And I'm curious how you think about balancing data privacy, uh, patient, you know, patient privacy with uh, sharing information in a way that uh, advances scientific progress. I, I love the privacy questions um, because, again, I think that um, what I found is that most people actually want to participate in research. So when we started the company, it was sort of hypothesized people don't actually want to participate in research. It was almost this mindset of a clinical trial, like get them to come in and consent for everything because you never know if you'll be able to really get anything else. And I looked at things like Susan G. Komen and Live Strong and like all this enthusiasm to do walks. Like people really actually want to make a difference and even bone marrow drives and such. And I go again to some of these human subject consent forms where they don't return information back to individuals, like, and frankly, I find them super insulting. Like why, like you really, like it's the paternalistic side, like you think I'm not capable of getting this information? And just to like level set with people, there's a JAMA study from I think 1960 where they asked physicians whether or not they would tell a patient that they had cancer. And 90% of, physicians said they would not tell their patient. So the world has like really evolved and it's come a long ways. And like, I think it's kudos to the medical world for evolving, but I think that we can absolutely do more with looking at individuals as like a responsible individual who can handle their information and more as a partnership. And so like right now, um, a lot of healthcare providers and insurance companies and Epic, they all, use HIPAA as a way to not let a consumer share their information. There's always these concerns like, oh, a consumer might get their medical records and then accidentally share it in the wrong way, um, do the wrong things with it, um, or it might be like too much information for them. There's kind of a very paternalistic take on it. And I've just always felt like you should be entitled to your information and then put it on the individual. Like, if you want to share it in your ways, like, allow you to share it. So to answer your question specifically, like, I think that there should be transparency and I think there should be choice. That's like the hallmark of everything 23andMe does, is like, I'm fiercely independent and I never want someone telling me what to do. And like, the last thing I want someone telling, like, my healthcare provider should not be telling me what to do. Like, give me the information and I will make my own decisions. And I would, 80% of our customers opt in to research. It's not even like they have to click out of it, like they're electing to opt into research. So I would argue that even more people would opt into research if it was given a choice. And that was kind of my point with Stanford, like why aren't I giving a choice 
of actually like opting in or opting out. Like, why do I have to be part of it? And so I do think that choice and transparency is like actually how you build trust. And I think a lot of consumers actually really want to be part of it. But I also would, one more thing I would put on you is like, people should have the right to know the results. So if you participated in a study, tell people what came out of that study. Like most people participate in a clinical trial and they have no idea what happened. Like, isn't that crazy? Like I just, again, I find it totally insulting. Like don't treat me like a human subject, treat me like a partner. Hi, I'm Harshit Hi. and I'm, I'm from India. I'm studying uh, uh, business here. Mm -hmm. I want to understand uh, how you have used, uh, or maybe how you have insights from genetics on uh, racial inequality. Yeah, we, I mean, look, looking at, um, looking at diversity, I mean, so it's a question, like there's, there's lots of complexity to your question. Like, I would say a couple things. Like one, when we started 23andMe, we never expected that we were gonna be in the dialogue about race. Like we got into it for research and all these things and like suddenly we're about redefining race. We absolutely can see, um, like we had one really interesting publication where we asked people the definition of African American. And you can see how people in the South might have 10% African DNA and they do not identify as African American. And you have people in Seattle who have zero percentage African DNA and they identify as African American. So even defining like what you are in your environment, where you are, like it's super complicated. So there's absolutely aspects that I think 23andMe can have an impact on um, by helping understand you know, genetic ancestry and likelihood to respond to medication or likelihood to have an issue. So for instance, there's someone named Carlos Bustamante at UCSF, and he does phenomenal research in the Latino population and asthma. And he has seen, like there's certain medications that people should never take in the Latino population, but why are they prescribed? And you have another example where in Hawaii, the state of Hawaii does not allow the sale of Plavix. Like Plavix is, again, it's a well-known, it's an anti-clotting drug, and it's because so many people in the state don't respond to the medication. So I think one way, like again, it's racial and, and health inequity is like is a huge issue. But I think one thing that you can actually start to do is really understand, like not racial profiling people, but really understand your genetic ancestry and what the mutations are that you have, and then whether or not you have a predisposition for a, a condition, and should you be managed in a different way, or whether or not you have a predisposition to like not respond or likely to respond to a medication. So I do think there's a ton of opportunity to have um, improvement. And again, you know, racial profiling is the only, you know, it's, it, it's, it's the last area where it's acceptable is in healthcare. Like it's the first line of every medical record, you know, 45 year old white male comes in. Like it's, it's that's something I think that we actually really have the opportunity of changing. Hi, how's it going? My name is Jamas. Um, uh, like Neil, I'm also an MD, MBA student. Ooh, I love and I, it. Um, I worked in a Huntington's disease clinic for a mm -hmm. year before medical school, and a lot of times the genetic results that they would get was some of the most devastating news they could ever hear in their entire life. And uh, how would you respond to people who believe 23andMe should have a more thorough, informed consent process before releasing information about like BRCA1 uh, mutations, for instance? And then do you foresee a future where people might push um, to have patients act on some of the information they receive and, and how are you preparing for that um, once those treatments are available? Yeah, I think, um, so again, it goes to some of the paternalistic questions. Um, I think that you can absolutely have a great informed consent online. And I think that's the kind of thing, it's like, it should not be a debate, it's about data. Like, generate data where you ask people to fill out the online consent and then you ask them to go through counseling and then you have them answer those questions, like, can you understand it? So we've done a lot of work about, like, are people understanding what they are getting? Um, so I would argue that having an online consent and making sure is potentially even better. Um, 
So for instance, 23andMe has a, you go through a number of consents. Like you can't sign up accidentally. It's a hard process. Um, reports like the Alzheimer's, BRCA for breast cancer are behind an additional layer of consent. So you have to click through and there's a video that talks about what potentially happens. Um, there's all kinds of resources about like, hey, here's the information you might learn. This is what to expect. And we see people pause on health and not everyone wants to know health. And to your point on Huntington's, um, the information is real. Like it's, it's, it's meaningful for people. But Huntington's is a, is, a, is, a, is a slightly different story because you can't do anything about it. Versus in BRCA, at a certain age, you can. Like you can find out that um, you, know, you are high risk and get a prophylactic mastectomy and oophorectomy. Um, and we've seen people, like we have thousands of customers who've now gotten this. And we can see that you know, 20 to 30% of our customers never would have qualified under existing research, under existing insurance guidelines. So I would argue that healthcare has huge limitations because we have not enabled broad access. And so saying that you can't get this information until you have a one-to-one, -one, in-person kind of interaction only puts up barriers to access. Like healthcare, like for me also, the fundamental premise, and I actually learned this, I would spend a lot of time investing in India, Healthcare will never be like accessible to all if it's dependent upon a one-to-one -one interaction. Like that, like that right there should be a good concept for all of you to be able to run on. Like it's not, you can't really improve care for people unless we find ways to automate it more and more. And so that has to happen. And the first company I ever invested in, talk about things that were too early, it was a pap smear company called Neuromedical. And it was one of the first AI companies that I'd ever seen. This is back in 1996. And they would take pap smears, the majority of which are normal, and they'd run them through the machine, and then they would isolate. Here's the top 20% that we need a pathologist to look at. And the company got taken down by the pathologist. Like, how dare you automate our job? Um, but the reality is, like, you can't have scalable solutions in healthcare if you don't have automation in some ways. Like I ask my kids sometimes, like all of you here, like you probably don't remember, like when I was little and I wanted to book a hotel in Paris, I had to like set my alarm and like wake up and call and like talk to a human. Like that's how it worked. And like now we're all totally spoiled. Like you go online, you can just book, like it's all automated. Like we never talk to people. And so like healthcare has to go more and more in that direction and then save like the really expensive precious, precious resources for people who really, really need care. We have time for one more. Hi, I'm Brianna. I'm a geneticist and actually a law student here. Mm. Um, and so talking about privacy um, and consent, the thing that's different about genetic information, it's, it's not just about you, it's about your family. Um, so how do you think about your responsibility for community consent or familial consent in, and community and familial understanding of the data that you collect? Yeah, that... That is also, that's a great question, and it's a huge complexity here. Um, so we have gone with the hypothesis, like it's your, you, it's your DNA, it's your right to learn about yourself, but there are absolutely consequences. And so for instance, your mother might not wanna learn that if she's a carrier for BRCA. And you could get tested and find out that you have you know, two copies. And therefore, it's 100% determinist, like your mother has it. Um, and we've seen that instance. Um, and we see this, I would say, what's interesting, again, I love all the MDs in here, and it'll be super fun, we should chat more later. Um, the, the part that, we don't get lots of consternation and concern about, about health reports. Like our customers we find are mostly, like they're okay. Like they, they like a BRCA report is not fun. Um, to get, but like they can handle all of this information and we've proven that now in spades. The part that no one anticipates is that their parent is not their parent or their sibling is not their sibling. And that has real, you know, if you have the access to your genetic information, you're gonna learn things about your entire family. And so I don't think that there is a realistic world of group consent. I think the reality is like you own the right to your own body 
but we absolutely try to educate people like that your information has consequences. But I would say when no one ever thinks it's them, that is not related to a family member. Like there's no much, like, and we have an additional consent form, like that is just always a surprise for people. But it's, it's, a, it's a very real and very tricky aspect of 23andMe is that you're not just related to like your immediate family, like this whole room is genetically connected. And so any number, like you would probably take some percentage of this room and kind of connect everybody. So I, I totally real, and that's, in some ways there's, there's the inspiring part for research in that like we really are all in this together. So like if you wanna solve like the mystery of the human genome and you wanna solve, you know, like, like the genetics of various disease and what, like, what does it really mean to be well, it is within the power of all of us coming together. But there's absolutely has to be some of the ethics and like the consent of like how are we actually all getting together? And that's where I said like there's, and Stanford is let, like again, Hank, Hank who, who is again in, engaged with us quite a bit, um, but there's really interesting questions around this, around ethics. And that's why, again, I'm eternally grateful to Joanna Mountain when she came from Stanford. Like, she was absolutely a thought leader in ethics. And, like, when I always think about the difference between 23andMe and other companies, like, Facebook didn't start with, like, a consent form. Like, I know they have a research team and other things, but, like, there's no consent that's part of it. Like, 23andMe from day one had consent and engaged with ethicists and, like, really thought through and recognized there's consequences. But in some ways, like the, what, the guiding principle for 23andMe is transparency and choice. And whether it's like transparency in, in yourself, it's like choice whether you want to get your genetic information, choice if you want to participate in research, choice if you don't want to do all these things. Like, and I think that's one of the issues I have in healthcare is like most times you're not provided choice and you're not provided transparency. Well, thank you, Anne, for your leadership and your wisdom. And thank you all for coming. That concludes you from the top. Thank you.